Art of Nepal is created by the Nevars and is ancient. Nevars are the indigenous people of this land. All the temples, all the art you see is made by these Nevars who has been actually suppressed by conquerors and destroyed, sold and bought, unfortunately. But Nevari art is very ancient. When we had temples, you know, America was not even found. Columbus hadn't found America. Namaste and welcome to Khojpatra. Today we are in talk with Romeo Shrestha, who is an artist based in Nepal, but currently he is living in Ireland. His artworks is in the British Museum and apart from that, his artworks are also in the 17 most precious museums around the world. Today we will be talking with him regarding his art, regarding his life and regarding everything. His life, as he said, he had been traveling around the world and most recently he had also painted in one of the darbars, one of the palaces of Dalai Lama. So we'd like to welcome you once again to the channel Khojpatra and we'll be talking with the artist himself. So mostly what we do is we talk about art, we talk with the, with the artist regarding their artwork and how they began their artistic career. But <clears throat> talking about it, I found one of the most significant and interesting fact regarding you. When you were five years old, a different group, group of monks visited you. What had actually happened in that time? It is a very old tradition that great masters reincarnate again and again to finish their work if they leave job unfinished. So at a very young age, few monks arrive saying that their master was born in that house. What did they actually say when they saw you Well, they wanted to take me to the monastery. And for sure, my mother was having none of it. And my dad, he was a powerful government official. So no way they were going to take me to the monastery. And at that time, very heavy-heartedly, I had to tell the oracles that in this lifetime, my monastery will have no walls. When you have no walls, you don't need any door or keys. So the wisdom I have, the knowledge I have to share in this world is open. It's not only limited, locked up, finite in the monastery walls. But now today, my work can be found all around the world, not just in the monastery. How was your childhood like? What was your school days like? Let's talk about it a bit. Mm. Childhood 
is a very interesting state in our life. That is the state when you actually live life. When you are a baby, you are innocent. When you are a child, you are carefree. There is no burden of life on you yet. Freedom. Freedom to be free. As you get older, as you get educated, more and more responsibility is put onto you. Suddenly, life starts being a job, duties, performance. Now, the secret about life is, if you can stay in a childlike mindset, even when you are 60 or 80, in fact, you start becoming like a child after 82 years old. You physically, mentally start being like a child. So childlike state of mind is the true state of being the happiest. So I don't know. My childhood and now is exactly the same. Have don't take life seriously. I've Back always played. Those days, like you said, you're starting in St. Xavier's, right? Yes. So you used to live in Chhatrapati and you used to travel to St. Xavier's? Well, the early years, I was in St. Xavier's Godavari. And Godavari was a long drive on rough roads, dirt roads. In monsoon, even the road would be so bad that we wouldn't even be able to go to school. So I was a boarder there. I went to school. I guess my father was scared that the monks might kidnap me. So he literally, I felt like he locked me up in the school in St. Javier's, in the foothills of Pulchoki in Godavari. Do you remember those days? I mean, like, what was Kathmandu like in those days? Is it same like today? Kathmandu. Kathmandu in those days were very different. There was hardly any street lights. There was hardly any traffic. Not that many people. There was hardly any people. It was different. It was like a little village. Everybody knew everybody. After the political insurgents, many people from all around Nepal came to Kathmandu. So Kathmandu population has 10 times, 20 times, 100 times. So it was very different then. And I could drive my car 50, 60 kilometers an hour, no problem. Today, I'd be lucky if I move. Always stuck in a traffic jam. You know, I mean, I used to drive like mad. It was an open street, no traffic. Was it from your school days that you were interested in art and paintings? Or was it way back or after you've completed your school? Mm, art for me was a lifestyle, I told you. Still today, it is where I am. Artists are pioneers of the human mind. They think different. Artists don't think in the box. That's why real true artists are always finding new ways for the human race to advance. And my art is literally an illustration or 
a mirror image of your higher self, literally. So when you look at any deities, it's not a deity out there from a different culture, but really a quality that we all have inside, if we can awaken, which makes magic. So after you passed your SLC, mm -hmm. did you directly go to college to study art or what had you studied in your initial mm -hmm. days? Well, when you take a normal path of schools, everybody's dream is to be an engineer or a doctor. So that you have a stable income as a career. So of course my father wanted to give me a choice. And I joined Umbridge Science College. And it was 2036 Nepalese year, big andolan. You know, so the college never happened. So I did go to Amrit Science College for a couple of years, and I studied physics. And when I went to LA, I changed my subject from science to anthropology because that was my interest. And when my professor heard my story, he told me I was wasting time in the university, that he would give me a PhD right away, that anthropology was study of people like me. So I thought I was free from college and went and became a surfer in Encinitas, the beaches of California, catching the wave. And after that you returned back to Nepal? Well, of course, I had to return. I came back. Then I went to Germany for a year as a visiting artist to mingle with the German artist. Then I went back to America. I've been going back every year to America. That is where I found out I could make a living. In some of your in interviews, I had heard that you had also had a shop here in Kathmandu itself. Let's talk a, bi a bit about it. What kind of shop was it? And how did you begin it? Um, wow. I mean, I am born in a Newar family. Newar are entrepreneurs. So there's not a single business I didn't do. I was the first tourist shop in Tamil. I started off as a coal stores selling Coca-Cola, tin fruit, trekking food. Then I made clothes for them to go into the mountains with yak wool, nambu. Then I made some jewelry for them, silver jewelry. So I created many businesses. I did tankers business, my passion. I did that for a long time. And eventually I ended up with a restaurant, Romeo's Restaurant and Bar. And... Was it in Tamil? Yes, all in Tamil. I'm a local in Tamil. Tamil was my hometown, home. That's where I used to hang out. So how did you get that idea of giving the free food there in, in Tamil itself? 
my last business was Romeo's restaurant and bar, and it was off the beaten track. So, no business. So I had this brilliant idea that if you advertise free food with a drink, I could attract some young tourists, trickers, who didn't have that much budget. The first drink would pay for the food, the profit. The second drink is profit. At least the restaurant would run. Of course, when the word went out, everybody thought I was mad. If you start a restaurant and you give away food, how ever are you going to make money? But for me, it was like fishing. When you go fishing, unless you put a bait, you can't catch the fish. So, to catch the customer of Pamal, Sioux String Travelers, if I offer them free food, they would come and drink and have a party, good music. It was a party house suddenly. So the restaurant was full. And it was always a great place for meeting. World's gold went out as far as Thailand, that if you go to Kathmandu, meet me in Romeo's restaurant and bar. It's free food there. So it was a home for away from home. Because food is a big security. I personally think food should never be a business. In my household, food was always free. Was it in those days that you met your girlfriend and to be your wife? Um, well, sometimes I wonder with a name like Romeo, I confront, I would not say obstacle, but difficult with the opposite sex. I had many girlfriends, but in my last business, my wife today walked in as a young girl, 22 years old. Something happened in me, like an alchemy. I felt, wow, this is the girl I want to marry. Of course, you know, she thought for a while I was not her type. I was wasting time. She came from a very good, well-to-do family. And I was just a local boy. So, I did meet her in a very different space, with pure love, with total surrender. Not you and me, but when you and me come together and becomes we, us. So alchemy, there was alchemy, and I knew she was going to be my wife, though she didn't believe in a word of me. So what was your initial days like? <laughs> my initial days with her was freedom. I didn't have a career. I had a career as an artist. I had a shop. She was also an artist. She was also trying to... It was freedom. We were living off suitcases from her parents' house to my parents' house. We all were joint family, so my home was with my parents. Were you permitted in your home after you got married? Or what was the story like? My father always told me I was an experiment. What a human being can do. So he gave me a lot of freedom to be anything, anything I wanted. 
So for 10 years, my wife did live in the joint family, in a Newari joint family. That was her fire test of washing dishes with hands, washing clothes with hands, living in a Newari household with Newari family rules and regulations. Luckily, I never encouraged my wife to learn Newari or Nepalese. So I could be the translator in the middle. My mother would make such a fuss about juto, this and that. And my wife would say, why is your ma mother shouting? I says, oh, she's just telling you your dress is beautiful. And my wife would always be complaining why my my mother would ask me. So my so, your sari is very beautiful. I'm not sari She didn't understand English. So I played along be, between the two different cultures, making it diplomatically kind. And when the kids came out and then I was felt like a second-class citizen, like untouchable in a strict Hindu family. That's when my heart changed, turned. I didn't want my kids growing up thinking we were not enough as a parent. So I quit. So what did you do after that? I bought a house without their consent which turned out to be a good investment. Stayed here one year. I didn't get the support. I left. Went back to Ireland. Or what was the story like? Well, I often say my life began after I met my wife. I saw a new world. An opening in the whole wide world started opening to me. So we went and when you are in love, magic happens. You become a superman. You can manifest anything. When I married her, I had $150 in my name. So I knew she was not marrying me for my money, for anything. And today, I put everything I earn in her name, so she never has to gold dig either. Or look at 50% of if she divorces me. So it is a different consciousness in a relationship, not the normal relationship you see or hear in the magazines and papers. So how did you go to Ireland? I flew. I didn't walk there. What was the story behind that you went through? <coughs> Karma, I guess. If you had told me when I was going to school that I would be living in an island, I would think you are a man. But somehow, now I live almost 30 years in Ireland. I still, my soul craves to be in Nepal with the momos and choilas, and, but I'm living in Ireland. So basically, what, you, what do you do then? Like I was saying, artist is not a career. <laughs> artist is a lifestyle. So in fact, I just live my life in Ireland. It's a beautiful country, all nature. And I work in the States. I make money in America. Was it there in the Ireland that you met Deepak Chopra for the first time? Yes. Deepak travels the world promoting his book 
and he was on a tour, book tour, and I met him there for the first time. And we became like family. I gave him meta energy, unconditional love, care. He felt it. He said, come to America, I will help you. And he kept his words. It's beyond. Now very often people connect in a surface level. Me, I make friends with the soul. I don't make friends with who they are, what car they drive, how much money they have. Rather I make friends with the soul. So you are looking out for each other. Deepak had just left Maharishi and was starting a new center. And I was one of his support system. His old center was full of my art. And my art has the power to transform even a concrete bunker into a sacred space. His center was sacred, full of my work, different energy. And I often appeared as guest speakers every year, once a year. So how did you begin your work with the Dalai Lama? Or what was your meeting like, first meeting like with him? Dalai Lama wanted to start a center. You couldn't quite call it an embassy, but a center, Tibet, Tibet house, house for Tibetans. So I was asked <coughs> to exhibit my medical set. Uh, it such happened in the inauguration of Tibet house my paintings were on the walls. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama came to New York to inaugurate Tibet House. That is when I met him for the first time. After that, he publicly announced that I was a 17th reincarnation of a monk artist from the Himalayas that came to Tibet. My life changed after that. Richard Gere, Elsie, all the supporters of Dalai Lama started supporting my art in a small way. The real energy started when I met Deepak and I saw funny money in Hollywood. That's when the ancient art of the Himalayas had a renaissance period. A lot more gold was used, a lot more time was masterworks. The paintings I created were never created in the past because this art never had such funding. So what kind of artworks are there in the Dalai Lama's palace itself, the Summer Palace? Um, Dalai Lama's Summer Palace is located behind the Patala, known as the Lord Khan Temple. It's on a lake. That's where he goes every summer to meditate. And in the walls of Lord Khan Temple, the whole illustration of how to achieve a rainbow body, body of light, is illustrated. And that was my last body of work. Now this body of work was only accessible to His Holiness. It was His secret temple. Body. I mean, what kind of body is that? 
Can everybody attain it? Like we have a physical body, an emotional body, this material body, we also have a body of light. <coughs> so everybody has a body of light. So nobody has to attain body of light. You just have to be conscious and aware of it. And when you are aware of your body of light, you are enlightened. Simple as that. But from the illustration, what I learned, the message of there, is we human beings are prison of our individual selves. My life, my taste, my judgment, my world. Most people live their life in that little tiny world, isolating themselves from their universal self. But the Buddhist way, or the artist way, I would rather call what I have learned from that painting is we all develop a certain mindset based on the family we are born into, religion we follow, culture we come from. We have a certain concept of this world. Now when you quieten your individual intellectual mind. When you quieten your individual conceptual mind, then suddenly you arrive at a point of sunyata, total silence. Sunya means geo, no more thoughts. In that place, deep inside, deep inside you, beyond the imagination of your mind, there is a pure being, pure light, pure energy, existing in total potentiality. You may call this your soul, but the mind has been educated and trained like monkey see, monkey do. If you are born in the Hindu family, you are a Hindu. Even if you are born in the Hindu family and a Christian adopts you, you become a Christian. So whoever brings you up, gives you his religion, the name, the family name. So all these identities we identify with ourselves is not the real you. To realize that is a spiritual journey. Mm. Let's get back to the days of Ireland. There in Ireland, you started imagining going to the museum and giving your artwork. How did it manifest? How did the idea came? And how did you manifest it? For the British. Oh. That's a very interesting question. Actually, the curator asked me the same question. Mr. Shrestha, why do you want your art in this museum? So I told him, Richard, what is his name? Richard, when you are parents, you want your kids to go to the best school, best college. Same way, 
these paintings are like my children. So I want them to be housed in the most prestigious, highest space possible. That's why I am here standing in front of you, offering it for you to give me the house. It just was, I guess I was so full of myself. I thought my art was worth being in the British Museum. I had that guts. I had that belief system. Though even the museums didn't have the guts, they never bought new paintings. They told me museum is for old paintings, not for new art, contemporary art. But they bought it because the quality Not only that, they found an excuse of saying we are trying to document where this art is going in the 21st century. So based on that, that British Museum bought four paintings for their permanent collection in the Oriental Antiquities. Was it after that that the 17 other museums acquired your artworks? Well, as an artist, when you are collected by museums, then you become a collectible. So my next aim as a career as an artist was to find homes, as many museums as possible under my belt. Now, Asian Art Museum in San Francisco want more paintings. So it becomes a collectible. Apart from your artworks, there are so many other books where your artworks are present. Could you tell us more about it? How the idea began of making or creating a book with your artworks? Mm, well, None of the idea was mine. It didn't come to me. It came to other people. A guy called Nicholas Calloway, who is the son of Calloway Golf Clubs, multi-billionaire, son had a publishing house. He wanted to publish the biggest book. He says, your art is so detailed, we must make it really big. And I says, why not? Just do it. But I never demanded, expected anything in my life. Everything I have done happened organically with a flow, not the way educated mind organize, you know. My life is different. Though I was educated by the Catholic fathers to dissect time to a half an hour, I guess that was too much for me. Ten years of that was enough. So today my life is time free. No appointments, no disappointment. So time as Deepak was recently saying, a lot of people in New York are going around saying, I have no time, I have no time. When you go around thinking you have no time, then the body metabolizes accordingly. You stress out, your body ages quicker, and if you stress out enough, you might even die with a heart attack, and you've definitely forecast it your life of having no time. So time is in your hands. You got to make time to do things what you want. If you do not make time, it will not happen. The only thing money can buy is time. Today, in this surviving world, where human beings are literally slaves 
to survival. As an artist, what does colors mean to you? Um, beautiful question. Art for painters, art colors, paints, there's a very interconnected I often describe that I try to express myself with colors and shapes. So colors and shapes are languages, like alphabets of a language for an artist to express itself. So colors are like means to express what you are thinking. And the images that you create? Are shapes and forms that play in my mind. So art is a language of colors and shapes. So with the language of colors and shape, I try to express which is understood by every human being. May he be French speaking, German speaking, English speaking, or Nepalese speaking. Art speaks a universal language. So what do you think about the art of Nepal? Art of Nepal is created by the Nevars and is ancient. Nevars are the indigenous people of this land. All the temples, all the art you see is made by these Nevars, who has been actually suppressed by conquerors and destroyed, sold and bought unfortunately. But Nevari art is very ancient. When we had temples, you know, America was not even found. Columbus hadn't found America. So Nepalese art is definitely superior in a certain way. Only problem is Nepalese don't understand that. So, but at the same time, I don't see art as Nepalese, English, German, French. It's a human expression. When an American human being stepped on the moon, it was not just American, but it was for the whole human race. So art is similar. Whatever I try to paint of consciousness is to be shared with the whole, not as a class. I have gone beyond borders. What primary goal like? I mean, do you work to satisfy yourself or for the customer's sake? Um, Well, when I had a shop in Tamil, definitely customers say, last price how much? I sold many art in that way, literally almost begging to get some money out of tourists. But I don't do it for money or anything, really. It's like breathing for me. You know, I breed art. So when did this realization happen? After you left, left yourself? It hasn't happened yet. I'm imagining it still. You know, that is my lifestyle. I'm inspired 
one day when the whole human race live that lifestyle, then I would consider I have achieved something. Because we really are one in different karmic bodies. Generally, it is said that after the artwork is complete, it does not belong to artist. I mean, when you are preparing it, it belongs to you. And after it's, it is complete, it does not belong to you. It belongs to whoever sees it. Do you believe in this philosophy? Absolutely not. There is a thing called copyright to you know, enforce what I am saying. Absolutely not. Because art is always you. There is no difference between the art and the artist if the art is made by true artist. It's part of him. How can it not belong to him? Nobody can take that away from him. So when somebody buys your artwork, I mean, do you have any kind of written contract where to use it or just to put it in the walls or they can make the calendars out of it? Do you make any kind of contracts like this? No. I am very free that way. If I believe that way, I will be a billionaire. The world of Tamil is copying my art. I don't think that way. If I can create something that will give another human being a livelihood, then my dharma is that. So what about the people selling the prints out of your paintings? Nobody has done that yet. If they do, then I will look for royalties for sure. And if they do it behind my back, then what can I do? I have no time to chase them. So there are a lot of aspiring artists here in Nepal as well who have been working in the field of art, who have been studying art. What's your message for them? I'm not a senior artist. There were many senior artists before me. Like Lin Sil Wang Dao was another great. In fact, I was in love with his daughter. That's what got me more interested in art. Sometimes love helps. He shared many philosophies of art. But one thing, one advice I do, I would give to most Nepalese artists is to do art from their soul, not even just the heart, from their soul, truth and honesty, not put up a face, because art shows. When art is made with greed to sell, it shows. It is traded in the same way. But my art, for example, I demand that all my artists actually sit down and chant mantra or listen to mantra while they are painting. Because all my artwork was painted with mineral colors, ground up minerals. Blue was lapis, red was cinnabar, green was malachite, gold was real gold. Now minerals have the power to remember. So this is why each of my painting is vibrating this sacred energy. That's why I say my art has the power to transform even a concrete jungle, concrete space into a sacred space. There are some artists in the contemporary art scene who kind of make the artwork 
just similar to the artworks that they had previously sold. Do you have any message for them? That is exactly what you were asking earlier. That is painting for customer's sake. I did the same. Wheel of Life sold, White Tara sold, Mandala sold in the shop. <coughs> so I told the artist to paint those. Now it's different. Now I don't know what I paint, where I will sell, will buy. It starts its own journey. Like the last body of work, the canvas was 27 feet long. There's no tanker shop wall to walk that. I didn't know where I was going to sell it. I just painted it because I wanted, I thought, it is time for the human consciousness to realize that we have a body of light, like we have a physical body, an emotional body, we also have a body of light. So that is the only real reason. Now, the Asian Art Museum and the Metropolitan Museum in New York, they are fighting over it. So, I have one more person, it's sold. Has they already acquired it? No, I'm negotiating. Let's talk more about the sadhanas that you did in your lifetime. When you began it, you began from the Hindu Agora. How did you begin it? What was the story behind it? Spirituality has been my passion and a big question, especially not being able to go to the monastery, being a monastery dropout, I always questioned about spirituality. I'm a born Hindu, brought up by Catholics, ordained or as a Buddhist, I do my Buddhist work. I'm married to Irish Protestant. Most of my friends are Jewish. And I love Rumi and Sufi. But nobody, in no religion, did I find the love I found with my mother. Only in her presence did I have the freedom to make mistakes and learn from. So really, my mother was the only teacher in spirituality. All the different religions have great essence in it. But when you isolate yourself as just one religion, then you are missing the boat. We are missing the universal self. But I don't know. I fell in love. And because of the caste system, I could not marry her which gave me a big question of should I be alive in a world where there is no place for love? I tried to kill myself. It's not easy to kill yourself. I tried many ways. Finally, before 
I succeed, I thought I need to know what death is. So I went in search of a, what is death? There is a human being lying down in the carts of Pasipati. He's got a perfect body, he has all the organs, everything. What is the difference between that guy and who is walking? What is death? So in that process I met Baba in Pasipati called Paglanand Baba which directly translates as Mad Baba. So Pavlanan Baba was a, a Gori Baba who claimed to be 115 years old. Always wore black. So I took his refuse for eight months to understand what death was about. And that was a spiritual journey which taught me first of all he taught me when I told him expressed him my interest to kill myself his first answer was you're dying anyway why hurry enjoy your life I never thought I was going to die in fact, nobody thinks they're going to die. If you knew how impermanent you are here, how short you are here, you would definitely value your time here. Just imagine even your kids, your parents, try to visualize them dead. Suddenly your love for them will be two times, three times. So death has a power to give you the power to live. So life force is a gift. This life is a gift to you from you. Be conscious about it and make every use of it, every second of it, because you are not going to be here forever. And that is what the God has taught me. Meditating in the cemeteries. Impermanence of life. And not be fussy about your individual taste or judgment. But to be accepting. And then I did four months with a Naga Baba, trying to understand sex. Because sexual energy is the most confusing energy known to human being, especially when you are young. So I learned the sacred side, the tantric side of sex. S sacred sex, conscious sex, not lust. So those were great universities, better than Harvard or Yale, or Eton. It's the university of life. I learned not to be attached. So today, I don't fuss about any food I eat, or any clothes I wear. Still, I land up wearing beautiful clothes because I have nice taste. Or people around me have nice taste. So I learned that when you let go, when you stop looking for something, everything becomes yours. When I give talks, you know, it started in students 25, you know, when I go to Deepak, I mean, Deepak gives me $18,000 an hour to talk. Last time in Tibet House, they auctioned out 
to have dinner with me for $23,000. So family paid $23,000. They paid for the meal too, in a very nice restaurant, just to sit down and have a chat about art. Great art lovers and patrons. So artists are, in fact, like I said, pioneers. In fact, the kind of art I do is not modern, contemporary, art for art's sake, individual concept, individual screen. It is a very universal, ancient wisdom of really, literally, illustrating your higher self and your created self your mental self, if you really understand my work. So any last messages? I mean, it's not the last in that sense, but any messages that you want to give to the general public? Um, Mrs. The last message Nepali, Nepal Kolai. I mean Nepali Vera. Nepal Kyo Kosto Tango. Nepal Le Yo Sangsar like Ki Dina Saksa. I'm Le Ki Lina Saksa. I know Ki. I mean, Nepali holiday, your son Sama, kid in a sock song. I'm some work of Dharma. I'm some work of humanity. I'm some work of Maya. Puriya Mahuni Maya. Satya Kubis Mahuni Maya. Manapta Bandi Chisne. Other Nyawai culture Mazani Wawani. Guti, in community, social structures. Because we survive in it, you are Sangsarma. Two cheese coni, very motto. Your Baltic Sangsar computer, gadget, motor, your Cheni Komata Ananda. So, Nepali, Una, you are too so by Ma Afafulai Nepali Panera Sansar Machino Korota Matsu Koye Kaide UN WHO UNICEF or the Third World Garib Panera Hamlai Chino Raki Malachita Duxa No there is a stone or lie Nepal ka bachao sa lua nabai pani kati haasi raasan. Amerika ka bachao sa computer e bani kati niyaore vannu baar. Kaili pude ra vuna dai. They want a new toy all the time. Nepalese ke, no toys. Still happy. A ke bani, ka a ke ke bani. Pautik sangsar, ao satche ko happiness khosne ho ni. Nepal ma has a time. So Nepali were of Zanmino, you're up to the so bad girl. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Mm.